Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Patrick Jones, who's going to be teaching us all about U.S. military drumming. Patrick, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, this is awesome. So you were recommended by Mark Robertson, who's turned out to be a really good friend of the show. And um, he's actually sent me some books and stuff to learn more about like Civil War era drums. And it's just been awesome. I didn't know anything about drum and fife or anything about that world. So he he kind of helped me get get into that. So uh, big shout out to Mark Robertson um, for connecting us. But um, yeah. So you, as I understand, are a very authentic restorer of very old drums. Um, you yourself do the Fife and Drum Corps, and you're a fifth grade teacher in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yes, yes. So I am um, actually drum right now with a Fife and Drum Corps um, called Camp Chase Fifes and Drums. And they are a uh, very historically minded uh, Fife and Drum Corps, and we'll get hired to play for different museums and uh, different events of uh, historical nature. Um, For example, the Henry Ford Museum over Memorial Day weekend. Um, We've been going there, I think, since 1985 uh, as a group. Uh, Obviously, that predates when I was born. (laughs) But we've been been going out there a long time, and and our focus is uh, mainly the Civil War period um, fife and drum uh, music, and uh, we take a lot of that material from the fife and drum manuals that were published and available during that time period. Okay, so why don't you tell me because I, I again, I've read a little bit about the book Mark sent me, but um, why don't you explain to everyone? What is fife and drum? I mean, it literally down to what is a fife? Like give us the whole spiel on that. So basically, you know, in, in a condensed version, um, you know, a fife is simply a six hold instrument that was the precursor to the flute and um the rope tension drum um goes all the way back probably to switzerland as the uh, first appearing in the military and uh it was probably used there for the first time in conjunction um with the fife in the military and then obviously as the fighting went on between the swiss and the french and the british um you know that tradition came across with the different um settlers um, that first appeared here in the American colonies. And the first time that we see in America the use of the uh, the drums is in Plymouth in 1627. And uh, Miles Standish was actually a drummer in Queen Anne's Army very early in the 1600s. And um, they would have the militia organizations formed in each of the towns as a protective measure against Native Americans and attacks and things like that. And what they would do is they would have a training day. And uh, along with the training day, you would have a drummer. And the drummer sometimes would be paid in sometimes food. <laughs> you, when you look back at different records of how they paid drummers then. Um, and the drummer would act as a signal for the men to march together, to drill together. Mm. And uh, even for town meetings, I'm, you know, drummers were used in the colonies uh, in replace of, you know, bells when, a when, you know, church bells would signal people to come for a meeting, you would actually have drummers doing that same thing. So a drum was used, um, throughout the, the colonies very early on, even the term drumming up business. That's a phrase that goes back to the drummers, you know, marching around the town drumming to stir everybody to come to the meeting house or to come to the, the center of the town for some announcement. Wow. That's so interesting. I remember seeing um, online and I forget where I saw it, but uh, how drums would be used by like fire departments to alert uh, people of, of, uh, of fires, I guess, or to get the fire department together. I think it was something like that. It would make sense to do that. Um, anything that needed to be communicated uh, pre having any electronic devices, yeah. um, it's a lot easier. And even when I talk to my, you know, fifth grade students about this, when we uh, discuss the history, you know, I tell them, I say, is it easier to go around yelling things for a thousand people, or would you get a group of drummers together and people would either come and yell at them to shut up and stop playing because it's annoying, <laughs> or they would come. <laughs> yeah. you know, because something was wrong. That's so funny. What subject do you teach? I never asked that. I teach history. Oh, that makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, I, I kind of, uh, started out, I've been in the same district now for 14 years and I started out teaching, uh, English language arts and social studies. Oh, great. And then they eventually ended up allowing us to, um, be kind of consolidated into specific groups. Awesome. And, uh, I was lucky enough to teach history. Perfect. 
I think you'll feel right at home talking to me uh, from teaching fifth graders. Um, I'm about that level there. So <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Okay. So um, now back to the topic and onward with U.S. military drumming. So we're in the colonies. That's the first use of it there, basically. Correct. That would be military. That would be gathering everyone. Where does exactly. where does it go from there? And then also as we go, maybe maybe talk about the gear like you did, where sure. it's rope tension and all this, and maybe a little bit about the manufacturers and just take it away. What you'll start to see in the uh, the colonies is you'll start to see you know an uptick as we get into you know the French and Indian War and you know different wars of uh, you know the U.S. and uh, the colonies and and things like that. You're going to start to see the output of uh, military music manuals. And that's where I think all of this gets really interesting, um, because if you take a look at a military unit, um, they start to designate one fifer and one drummer for every company. Hmm. Um, and usually there are 10 companies of uh, soldiers in a regiment. So you would have something called the regimental field music. So the whole idea behind having like a system of drumming needed to be in paper or needed to be taught so that people were playing the same thing. Yeah. And what you would start to see is you start to see this, okay, standardization of calls because you could have this guy over here playing something, this guy over here playing something. He's going to say, well, this is what I play to, for dinner call. Well, this is what we play for dinner call. And then you put them all together and they try to perform together and it's an absolute disaster. <laughs> and Washington actually writes about that. He writes about the music in the Continental Army, you know, being abysmal. And he said, something needs to be done because it's terrible. Mm. So they begin standardizing, and you see the first uh, writing of this in uh, von Steuben's uh, tactical manual. And there's a section called um, Beats uh, for the Drum or Beats of the Drum. Mm. And it goes down and it lists specifically what are the beats, um, how are you going to play it, uh, and it gives a little piece of information uh, about what the drummer's supposed to do. So that's the first time that we see here in the uh, American colonies something in writing standardized. Now, there's obviously people who had manuscripts. Um, a lot of things were you know, taught by rote drumming, obviously. Um, but that's really the first time I think you see something standardized to say, okay, here's how we're all going to do it. And that happens you know, during the Revolutionary War. Hmm. Then after that, we begin to see different manuals come out. Um, you have one Ashworth in 1812, and that one is adopted by the United States Army. And um, I think a lot of people today have tendency to stay away from the older manuals of rudimental drumming because they're very different than what our modern notation looks like today. Um, and what I mean by that is if you take a look at some of these older manuals, they will not write in any time signature. They will simply write as the beat that you're playing or by rudiment. So at the beginning, they'll have the list of rudiments. They'll show you what they look like, which are not the same as us. They sometimes write them on different lines. So the left hand is on one line, mm. the right hand will be on the other. That's interesting. Yeah. And then what they do is they put those together in groupings for a beating or even for a tune. It's very hard to do that, though, without having the fife melody to understand how it's supposed to go together. Yeah. So when you start looking at these different, uh, you know, music manuals, you have to do a lot of cross-referencing. You have to do a lot of analyzing what the fife is doing for the harmony to see how that fits along with the drum. But there's some very simple rules with, uh, with this rudimental drumming. And the most probably widely known one is most of everything starts with a seven-stroke roll. And the seven stroke roll is to be beat on the upbeat of the note before you would end or start marching with your left foot. So that's kind of like a widely known, it's kind of a joke that people use like, oh, how does that beating go? And it's like, oh, it starts with a seven. Well, that's, they all start with a seven pretty much. Yeah. So it's kind of a, <laughs> a widely known joke in the fife and drum world to tell people. Man, I love that there's jokes in the fife and drum world, you know? <laughs> I know. I, I don't know if I should be ashamed of that or if <laughs> I, proud. You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, one or the other. Yeah. But you start to see, you know, you start to see the standardization, which is very neat because then as wars... Uh, begin to happen, people begin to capitalize on that like anything else. And they start to print manuals and they start to steal even from each other 
you know, some of the, the ways that they write things. And you'll see that happen, you know, throughout history with people stealing <laughs> something. Sure. They'll steal a tune and they'll call it a different name. So because of the copyright infringement, it'll be exactly the same, but they'll call it something else. Yeah. And I think what really begins to, to get interesting with, with the teaching of this is by the time the Civil War comes around, is you started to have these schools of music where they were taking younger boys um, and they were teaching them how to play fife, drum, and bugle. And probably the most well-known, there was two of them, mainly in uh, the United States. It was uh, Governor's Island, New York, and the Newport Barracks in Kentucky. Hmm. And in Governor's Island, New York, there was a really fascinating uh, diary written um, by a drummer boy who was taken there um, when he was about 12 years old or so. And his name is Augustus Myers. And he chronicles the daily life of who his instructors were, what they had to do there, um, what they were required to do. And it's really fascinating to see that from a, a musical standpoint that this was not like, you know, oh, here's a young boy. We're just going to give him a drum and he goes off to war. They had a duty to perform and they had to know that duty in order to be a part of the whole military existence. Because when it comes down to it, the fife and drum was the communication aspect for daily life um, for soldiers. They heard the fife and drum every single day, when to get up, when to assemble, when to take roll calls, when to eat supper. Yeah. Everything was regulated by the fife and drum. Hmm. Let me ask you a question real quick. How do, so let's say I'm just a foot soldier. I'm not a drummer. I'm not a musician. I have no background on this at all. How do I learn what I'm listening to? How do I know this means go to dinner? How do I know this means let's get ready for battle? Because you would hear it every single day. Okay. So they'd say, so, maybe they'd train you and say, Hey, this is what this means. And then you hear it constantly. So they all practice listening. They all, they all knew Got if it. they were, they knew exactly. I could tell you probably, and from some diaries, they knew exactly what Reveille was because if you get an entire 10 fifers, 10 drummers, you have the full complement playing at 5 a.m. Yeah. And they would play, the first thing they would play is a Reveille sequence, which was about eight or 10 tunes. And the whole idea was to get these guys out of bed. Mm. And that's all that they, you know, that's all they did. So they would either get up out of bed and there's different uh, newspaper uh, sketch uh, sketches that you will see of drummers and fifers having things thrown at them by the soldiers huh. and you know trying to get them to stop playing that's but funny. that was their that was their job yeah to get them out of bed mm, that's so neat I think another important thing to remember too is this isn't like you know Alfred printing a bunch of drum books like even the manufacturing I've heard someone talk about like how it was like um like what do you call it? Where where they'd have to print them on the slabs and then like they're mm -hmm, printing blocks. Printing blocks. Yeah, it's just mm -hmm. fascinating. Like that's not an easy process. Everything was harder. It was, you know, when you take a look at some of these fife and drum manuals and think about the amount of time it would take to produce something like that, and then you know you got to look at a lot of different facets when you take a look at the manuals. The person who was printing it was not a musician. A printer by trade does not know really anything about musical notation. So, you know, some people will look at the manuals and say, oh, well, that one has mistakes. Well, they all have mistakes yeah. because you have think, you know, if you think about setting that type exactly so, it is really difficult to do. So, of course, there's going to be mistakes. Of course, there's going to be, you know, phrases and things in there that are, you know, don't really work. But we have to kind of say, well, if you look at these four other manuals and, and see how it has come from the, you know, uh, previously written manuals, then it makes most sense that they meant this. Yeah, sure. So there's some conjecture with it, but you can, you know, base it on a lot of historical fact as well. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. There's just so many little little side pockets you can go down with this. But um, okay, so carry on here. So we were in the early 1800s then. Yeah. So when you start to see the War of 1812 uh, happen, um, we have Ashworth's manual. And what you start to see then is you, after that, you start to see some, uh, some differences in the styles of music. And one very particular style of music you see is happening up in the uh, New England area. Um, specifically in Massachusetts, you start to see a manual come out called the Massachusetts Collection of Martial Music. And that's by Rumrow and Holton. 
And when you start to see this style come out, it's very unique in the way that it's played, the way that it's performed. And I think that's interesting because even within the fife and drum um, community, you see these different styles of music written. And it's interesting because later on, um, even in different uh, fife and drum diaries, uh, fife and drummers diaries, they talk about rival drum corps. And they talk about how the playing styles of the fife and drum corps in New York were very different than their playing styles um, of Massachusetts and other places. And um, they describe them as a six, eight, and he calls them uh, uh, the chunks of pudding, pieces of pie style that you hear in Massachusetts, as opposed to our get out the way old Dan Tuckerish style, which is written in two, four. So they talk about the way the soldiers march. What is that? And what does that mean? Chunks of pie. Like- <laughs> so chunks of pudding and pieces of pie. Yeah. I apparently, and this has been a long time. Uh, another friend of mine who I talk to very frequently about this, who's you know, and he's just a wealth of information. His name's Peter Emmerich, and uh, that refers to a tune, and uh, that tune I, I believe is in six eight time signature. Ah. And anybody knows, obviously, six, eight times signature, two, four sounds very, very different. Yes. And when you're marching to it, it almost gives you kind of a, you know, for lack of a better term, six, eight almost gives you a sort of swag sure. when you're marching to it. Yeah. And, you know, this this uh, drummer was talking about these different styles that their drum corps was used to playing as opposed to the other drum corps. And old Dan Tucker is a, is a pretty popular tune. It was a very popular minstrel tune. Hmm. Um, I think written by a guy named Dan Decatur Emmett, who was the author of another fife and drum manual. Um, see, there's so many little rabbit holes yeah, you can exactly. go down with this stuff. It's, <laughs> it's almost, you know, we joke around about that often. Like how far do you, down the rabbit hole do you want to go? Yeah. Um, there's just so many things, but it's when you're talking about something like fife and drum and you're talking about tunes, you're talking about rudiments, it's almost hard not to bring it all together sure. because there's so many facets that influenced it. Hmm. You know, even, you know, the Irish and the Irish immigration, you see a lot of jigs and you see a lot of Irish, um, music yeah. because that was the influence then. So you're going to see, you know, different types of things that happened in the, you know, the civil war drum fife manuals that are kind of a sign of the times, popular music, obviously like any other time period in American history. Yeah. Gotcha. But by the, but by the time the civil war, you know, rolled around, um, the civil war is basically your height, uh, your apex of fife and drum in military, because after the civil war, it starts to lose its, its flavor and you start to see the bugle take over more. So I think that, you know, if you're studying fife and drumming and, and, in that style of rudimental traditional drumming, I think its height would definitely be the Civil War because I think more manuals were printed between 1861 and 1865 than any other time period. Hmm. Um, and there's so many, you know, there's so many different manuals, and some of them are very similar, some of them are almost identical, and some of them are so different that you would have to look at it and say, okay, when was this printed? Who was this distributed to? Um, and which groups of you know armies were using specific manuals and that's really hard to determine sometimes yeah really do, do they um i'm sure they do i'm sure they're in like a museum they must still some of them must still exist right like yeah i have a few original oh, cool. uh, manuals from from that time i know um there's certain ones that are um you know identified to a certain person and that makes it really interesting because you know that whoever um whoever that person served with that unit was using specifically that manual. So you get a real good sense of what they were playing. Um, and, and the, you know, when it goes back to it, it, it was a very literate society, but you still had, you know, musical notation and reading is a lot different than just reading words. So you probably still had a lot of rope, you know, teaching and, yeah. um, you know, that still went on, but you had, at, by this time, you know, you're starting to see a, a real, good strong system of principal musicians drum majors you have professional musicians now in the military um you have brass bands and they are also now coming in and they're usually professional musicians with the regimental brass bands so you you see a lot of professionals now entering the scene as opposed to we need people just to play duty calls 
Now, bouncing off of what you just said, it would be like a musician who is a professional, let's say, very good drummer, but he wants to serve his country or he gets drafted or whatever happened there. Um, but you would go in and say, hey, here's my special skill that I have. Let me be a musician instead of being like nowadays, you'd say, I'm really good with computers. Let me be in the intelligence department. You could say like, hey, I'm a drummer. Let me go in and be the, in the in the um, in the, you know fife and drum, drum corps yeah absolutely okay. absolutely they had you know there were there were town brass bands you know predating the civil war from the 1850s oh, wow. and a lot of these town brass bands were you know in mass um mustered in with different companies and regiments and early on it was um allowed that every regiment could have a brass band and even some of the officers um paid out of their own pocket to make sure that their brass band had the best instruments and had the best equipment because they wanted them to look good and, you know, not to just be there for, you know, musical entertainment, but also it was kind of like, you know, competitive in nature yeah. for one officer's regimental brass band to be known as the best in the entire army. And they would of course be able to serenade the generals. They would be able to perform concerts and they did things like that, but whole brass bands were actually allowed to, uh, muster in and they were paid very well. They were paid more than the average soldier because they were specialized. Yeah. Now what happens though, is it got a little bit too expensive. So by 1862, I believe the war department said no more regimental bands. <laughs> we can't, <laughs> we can't afford that anymore. Yeah. Wow. So now it's going to have to be, um, you know, turned into, um, just brigade bands. So instead of having 10, regimental bands you're now only allowed one brigade band for your 10 regiments gotcha and and you start to see those and the nice thing about that you know with the the civil war is you have tons of photographic evidence of this and i think that's one of the the really nice things when you take a look at the civil war is there's so much photographic evidence of all of these things there's a lot of diaries that are uh, you know readily available the library of congress has an amazing resource you can go on, you can take a look at band books, um, original band books that they have, um, they have scanned in high definition, and you're able to take a look at the music that was played. And uh, some regimental brass bands that are now like recreated brass bands use that exact same arrangement hmm. um, of music, which is really cool because That's you're cool. taking something that hasn't been heard on original instruments. And a lot of these brass bands today even have all original instruments. So you're hearing original music played on original instruments. Man. in a style that would have you know only been seen in the 1860s and the 1850s that's so cool so um this right here where we're talking about 1861 to 1865 the civil war this is the big 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 moment for these guys right like this is the heyday yes. so let's spend some time here because um First, my question is, is we're talking about both sides, the Union Army and the Confederate Army, correct? They're yes. both using these. Okay. Now, in the like the 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 battle is on, and I would speak to it as if not everyone is from the United States and knows the, you know, the things that we may know, especially you as a, you know, history teacher. But um what was it like for for one of these drummers? I'm talking like how old was was he? I'm assuming it was all he at that point. Um, yes, yes. Okay. Supposed to be, supposed to be in the in the in the military at that time. Got it. Um, basically, you know, there there's definitely a large misconception of what these you know bands and drum corps and and musicians did uh, when the battle you know when battle actually occurred. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I, you know, I, I tell my students this and I, I do a lot of interpretive, um, you know, demonstrations. And I explain to people that if you have thousands of guns going off, you have cannons, you're never going to hear a drum beating really anything <laughs> no. on a battlefield. It's kind of absurd. Um, and what really they were used for during the battle is they were used by the surgeons and they were used by the medical staff to go get wounded. Um, so they were definitely exposed. Um, there's a lot of stories, Medal of Honor uh, recipients even of, you know, going after men who were wounded and pulling them um, back. And, uh, you know, you talk about age, it's really all over the place. The term drummer boy, I don't know is, is so accurate during this time because you see age ranges all over the place. You see 
17, 18, 19, you see in their 30s and their 20s. Mm. And the way that I talk to, you know, a lot of people to try to explain that is, you know, most 10, 11, 12 year olds are not going to be able to handle the rigors of campaign. And what I mean by that is if you are marching 17 miles a day, 15 miles a day, uh, you're enduring the freezing cold, you're enduring the heat, you're carrying items, you just can't do that at that young of an age for the most part. No. So you're going to need, you know, people who are able to endure that and they're going to, you know, have to be able to sustain those type of uh, element situations. Hmm. So when you take a look at, again, which is great that we have the photographic evidence, we have the muster records, we have the roles of the men, their ages. Now, some of them did lie. But when you take a look at those, you can see that, you know, you're you're talking more into their upper teens and 20s. For the for okay. a, I think a, a majority of them, the whole idea of like the Johnny Clems who were ten years old and shooting people, it's far and few between. It's you know not not as likely, but you know during the battle, definitely they were they were not always playing. There are a lot of accounts though them playing men into battle for morale, and uh, that happened you know numerous times. You know at famous battles like Gettysburg, you know they talk about that with the Iron Brigade marching on to a Scottish piece um, called the Campbells are coming just before they, you know, uh, engaged on the first day. So there's, there's a lot of different uh, pieces where we know that they, they played specific tunes in the wilderness uh, in Virginia, for example, as um, they were marching down, the Fife and Drum Corps was playing and, and everybody was actually laughing and General Grant had come out of Todd's Tavern said, you know, what, what's the fuss about? And he goes, well, you know, why don't you know, General, what they're playing? He goes, no. And they said, well, the tune is Ain't I Glad to Get Out of the Wilderness. And he said, well, I only know two tunes. One of them's Yankee Doodle and the other one isn't. <laughs> so there's, <laughs> there's certain times that we know, which are really cool, exactly what a band or a fife and drum corps was playing at an exact moment uh, in history. Wow. You know, and we yeah. have, you know, the music to that, which is, I think, very cool. Can you back up real quick and explain a little bit about what you meant about surgeons would use them? So how would that work? Like, like they would so, take a drummer with them to go out and get retrieve soldiers or basically they would most likely ground their drums and their musical instruments somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then the, the surgeon in charge would be their boss oh. and he would say, okay, you know, go out there and they would just get wounded men oh, from wow. the battlefield and bring them back to wherever the field hospital um, happened to be. And by field hospital, I mean a barn. Um, I'm talking about somebody's outdoor of their house, yeah. anywhere that they were set up because these were, you know, situations and that could go down a whole nother rabbit hole, the, the ambulance corps and everything. Yeah. But these were situations where, you know, they needed immediate triage of men and it was, things were happening very quickly and it had to be right there, right then. So the musicians were detailed to go out and get the wounded men bring them back and hopefully, you know, have them be worked on in a timely manner, which sometimes we know wasn't so timely. Um, but that was, that was their, their job during the battles. Okay. So then that takes me to another question of our, were drummers like, like they didn't have a gun. They were not like trained for battle. They were more almost like you said, like, like in the medical field of just like people who have a service they have a purpose to serve, but would, would they have guns? Would they have knives? Would they protect themselves at all? They were not issued um, any sort of equipment or weapon. Um, they they had a musician sword they were issued, and that was pretty, uh, you know, pretty absurd to even think that would do anything. It was more ceremonious, you know, it was a musician yeah. sword to make them look good, and a lot of them threw them probably away oh, because they were cumbersome or put them on the wagon trains to not be used. Um, but that was all they had. And uh, usually I think, and they were exposed to fire. I mean, so there was no doubt that they definitely sometimes were exposed and not that, you know, anybody would be aiming at them, particularly because these armies are firing, you know, hundreds of yards away from each other. But yeah, there's definitely evidence that they were killed on the battlefields, um, you know, by stray musket balls, just the same because they were exposing themselves in the same way, or even, um, I know there was an Ohio drummer at Gettysburg who actually crawled out and pulled, he was a Medal of Honor recipient, crawled out and pulled one of his screaming comrades to safety uh, on his back 
and actually put him on his back and crawled and pulled him back to the Union lines wow. um, in between the Union and Confederates, you know, firing at each other. Hmm. So there were definitely acts of bravery, I think, that people would be surprised about, you know, seeing um, these these musicians who really were not combat soldiers um, taking active roles when the need arose, um, which, you know, I think really says something for the um, the type of people that, uh, you know, they were during the 1860s, you know, that duty, yeah. um, you know, their comrade, you know, comradeship that they had, um, I think is something that is very difficult to see in modern day, sometimes, you know, day to day life of what, you know, these, these guys were enduring yeah. on a daily basis. Man, and again, so this goes back to my question of this is on both sides. So it would be the same because, yeah. because again, I guess your neighbors on one day and 1860 and then your enemies in 1861 so it's not like they're different countries i mean it's the same people no you exactly and i mean you know the the north was obviously much more supplied Mm -hmm. um than the south which is kind of a cool segue when we get into you know i can start talking a little bit about drum making yeah you read Um, my mind i was gonna say let's let's talk gear too yeah so when you start to take a look at manufacturing of musical instruments, that's a very, you know, interesting thing as well. Um, because if you, you know, go back uh, a lot of years and you see people who were skilled at making cabinets, cabinet makers, coopers, woodworkers, they were able to make drums. So when you start to take a look at the construction techniques of these, uh, these older rope tension drums, there starts to be a uh, kind of a similar way of making them. And, you know, you really have some main components to the drum. You have your drum shell, which is wooden. And the most of the ones I would say that I've seen a large majority are going to be steam bent. Um, and it's, it's hard to say how they were steam bending them then, whether they had a steamer set up and they, you know, had a steam box and steam bent them or, The wood was green, obviously, and, you know, the moisture content, and there's all those things to think Mm -hmm. about, um, and whether they were soaking it in water or even boiling it. Um, But either way, they had to do something to bring that moisture content up. And then they would bend the shell, and they would usually use some sort of hide glue to uh, connect that seam, that overlap that they would have, the scarf joint. Mm. And uh, to further reinforce that, you see a lot of use of uh, either iron nails um, decorative tacks and, and a lot of makers did have a specific tack design that they used. Um, you start to see, uh, very famously in Connecticut, the Brown family, um, have a, a very unique style of tack design where you would have a circular tack design, uh, around the vent hole. Then you would have a, a series of diamonds and literally you can take a look at a drum and I can immediately identify, oh, that has to be a Brown drum. Just because of the way the tack design is and the and the way that it's made, wow, very um, ornate so and you know it is it's fa- it's yeah. fancy, you know, and yeah. it's it's that's the way it was meant to be. It was they were drum makers too, so they were you know particularly I think they're they're around in the eighteen you know early eighteen hundreds eighteen twenties. I have a brown drum from eighteen twenty five, and uh, it, it's it plays absolutely beautifully, and it's it's very large as a, as field drum goes. It's earlier, so it has about an 18 inch diameter and a 16 inch shell. So when you add on the hoops to it, you know, you're looking at another two to three inches or so. Um, so it's quite a large drum. Hmm. And, Gosh. um, so that you have the shell, which is the main component. Then you have the hoops, um, the counter hoops, which are usually painted some sort of color to protect the wood. It's, uh, you see different shades of red, but red seems to be the predominant color. Um, you know, obviously they would use vermilion, um, to paint those. Hmm. And then the heads are either calfskin, sheepskin, uh, goatskin. And then you have the snares, which were not called snares. Then they were guts yeah. because they were made from sheep intestine. Huh. And, uh, those obviously lay across the bottom and depending on the maker, depending on the year, you have either a snare strainer or a large amount of drums I've seen. They just lay the guts right across the bottom and you just pull them to tighten them uh, you know, on the side and that's it. There is no metal snare strainer. There is nothing like that. And there are no dampeners. There's no cloth because you don't want anything to dampen the sound of those drums. You want that sound to carry as far as possible. 
So that modern idea of let's dampen the sound of a drum to get it as crisp as possible, they wanted the exact opposite effect in the 1800s, the 1700s, because you want that sound to carry as far as you can so that everybody could hear what you were doing. Man, that's... The drums were, like you said, they're they're giant. That's just fa- that's fascinating. This had to be heavy. It had to be a heavy drum, right? You'd be surprised because the shells are only about an eighth of an inch thick. Mm, okay. And what's interesting about it is if you take a look at the type of trees that were growing in the 1800s, what availability they had. They had a, the availability of a lot of old growth forests. And I think what that allows to happen is it allows the, the grain on the wood to achieve a, a, uh, a much tighter density. So you could get a much stronger shell at a much thinner, you know, a much thinner um, thickness. Hmm. Wow. And it's going to withstand a lot more tension than a younger tree. That makes um, sense. Wow. Which is very, you know, which is kind of odd to think. And you know, it's really hard to find a piece of ash today, you know, a, a tree that's going to allow you to make a, you know, a 16 inch wide board. That's a, it has to be an old tree. Yeah. And they're just not in, you know, they're just, you just don't have them around like that anymore. No, the world, I feel like things have been a little picked over. I mean, this was back mm-hmm. when it wasn't like that. So, and one thing I, I think we could talk about a little bit too is um, I started the show about two years ago. I really didn't realize until, you know, a couple episodes in, you just doing, I'm doing research about how traditional grip starts because of these guys marching. And in order to walk, they had to have the drum at an angle and therefore their left hand would be, you know, with the stick coming out traditional grip with it sideways. What's interesting about that is even in the fife and drum manuals, you see a lot of the beginning, um, they're, they're called self-instructors. So supposedly a lot of these fife and drum manuals are meant to be, I could go and purchase this and I can open it up and I could basically teach myself by reading this, this fife instructor, fife and drum instructor. And one of the things that they talk about at the beginning of almost all of them is how to hold the sticks. And the other thing they teach, which is kind of funny to me, it's how to hold the sticks and how to stand. And I, I always, I always like that because it teaches you posture. It yeah. teaches you how you should present yourself, you know, as a player. Um, and then it goes even some of them go into detail. They actually have uh, prints of somebody standing, showing you how the stick should look in your hands, and it's very descriptive, showing just the hands and how your grip should be. And um, you know, the interesting thing is, is with these types of of drums, you definitely need to practice moving and yeah. playing. Because of the types of slings and the types of, uh, you know, carriages that they had, you know, they didn't stay still and your arms definitely don't remain in one place, um, you know, while you're playing, which is, you know, takes you to a whole nother thought of the playing style. Whereas today I feel like, you know, and and I'm a DCI person um, from a lot of years where it was a lot of wrist. You know, we played a lot of things with the wrist and you allowed a lot of rebound off of a head because a Kevlar head you could drop something on a Kevlar head and it's going to shoot up 10 feet because it's so highly tensioned. Yeah. When you look at the playing style um, from this time period, if you're pulling out a calfskin head at five o'clock in the morning and it's damp, you might as well try playing on a pillow <laughs> or a piece of paper. Sure. So how do you achieve 10 minutes of the Reveille sequence on a drum head like that? Well, obviously you have to play differently. And I think this very open style of playing with, um, you know, a lot more arm, I think originate, you know, really comes from, um, you know, that time period from the old rope tension drums, because that's how you had to play on them. The last thing you wanted to do was just play soft. Yeah. So there, you know, I, I'm all, I always laugh. There was a, um, a review done of a, a fife and drum manual from 1855, um, named a guy named Klein Hans, who was a Marine Corps drummer. And there is a, in the Carlisle, I think in the Carlisle Barracks archives, there is a note where the review board listened to what he had to say about drumming. And he was kind of, he was basically convincing them that they should adopt his manual to be used in the United States Army. And one of the things he had requested is that there is nothing that shows dynamics. 
and they had said they would take it under consideration, but everybody on the board agreed that everything was to be played loud. So it didn't (laughs) matter about dynamics. I'm like, that's every drummer's dream right there. Just hit as hard as you can. (laughs) Everything loud. Yeah, man. That just speaks to that whole like, like, don't muffle it. Don't do anything. No. We just need to hear this damn thing and make it as loud mm-hmm. as possible. It's not, um, don't be fancy, just play loud. Yeah, and I actually kind of like that even today when I go and you know and I hear a fife and drum corps just playing, you know, up to their ears. And I think that's that's awesome because if you know you have your drums the correct way, if you have a calfskin head on, and you know it's not getting in that register of the fife. And I think the problem that we see a lot of times now, and even like Camp Chase, we had used plastic heads for a little while. And the problem we had is those plastic heads could tension up into the same range as the fife, which would then drown the fife sound out. So mm. we had then kind of transformed into um, or progressed into all calfskin heads, same number of drummers. We were all playing this, you know, as loud as we could, but it didn't affect the fife. The fife's cut through a lot more because we had the calf skin on and it wasn't in the same range. It was a much deeper sound. Yeah, sure. So, and that's, you know, kind of going, I think by the wayside calf skin is, is in the modern fife and drum world. I see calf skin going by the wayside more and more, which is, um, you know, kind of the way any hobby goes, things move and they transform. Yeah. But you know, me being a, a very traditionalist, I don't have a single drum in my house here that has a, uh, a plastic head on any of my rope drums. <laughs> it makes sense. But I mean, you're you're a purist, so I yeah, I love it. Yeah, I just love it. I think it's fascinating. I think it has a whole different feel. You know, I can just this morning one of my buddies uh, text messaged me and said, "Man, it's a great day to play on calfskin because it's sunny out, it's dry. You know, it's and there's no moisture in the air, and there's just something about playing on that calfskin." Um, and the sound that it produces, the warmth, the tone, the way it feels is very different. I'm sure it's like that with a lot of guys who play on some of those old kits yeah. and they have some calfskin heads on them. It's very different sound, very different feel. Yeah, definitely. Now, if anyone's listening and doesn't really know about the whole calfskin head versus mylar and plastic, I would direct you back to there's an episode on the history of drum heads. There's one on the history of Remo. And then there's also one on the history of painted drum heads, which was about um, a light bulb being inside and heating up the head. So if if you're hearing all this and you kind of don't know what we're talking about, check those out. Um, Now, I wanted to ask you, did the government come in and say to people, you're making drums for the US Army now, get to work, go in there and do it, we'll pay you? Like, did they make people start building drums, like change factories over or anything like that? Nobody had to do that then. Um, the nice thing is, is there were already military furnishers and manufacturers um, in the United States prior to the Civil War. Yeah. Um, one of the probably largest firms um, out of Philadelphia specifically was called Horseman. And uh, William Horseman had started the firm uh, in the 18, I want to say 1828 or so. Um, and that firm produced military goods of a variety of natures. They produced flags. Um, they had swords, they had any type of military furnishing that you could imagine. Hmm. Um, they produced, and one of the things that they produced also were drums and they produced those prior to the civil war. Then, um, horsemen's sons both joined in. They opened up a firm in New York as well, and they produced drums in both places, provided a lot of drums. There's actually, um, some schematics of the horseman factory that I was able to find through some digging and it shows the layout of their entire factory. And on the, the one building on the second floor, it says drum maker shop. So they had a specific area where they were making drums. Now, a lot of other people, you know, were able to jump in on that bandwagon. Um, you know, there was another musical firm, uh, Zimmerman, uh, they jumped in, they had contracts at the beginning of the war for drums. And then of course you need drumsticks. And if you, you know, take a look at places like Philadelphia, there's a lot of wood turners. There's a lot of people who are basically set up to make drumsticks without a problem. And you'll see thousands of um, pairs of drumsticks being turned um, out of cocoa wood, as it was called. Um, and there's no descriptions on length, size, weight, nothing. The only thing they say on the quartermaster records is, you know, a thousand or two thousand or three thousand pairs of cocoa drumsticks. Mm. And uh, so you see a lot of people 
picking up the you know slack, I guess, for lack of a better word. Anybody who was doing woodworking could most likely make a drum. Um, and there's tons of manufacturers in the Philadelphia area. You have um, contracts through the government of different companies to make drums. You have private um, sales of drums, obviously, and musical instruments. So when you take a look, I, I, I recently really started taking a look at the Philadelphia area um, because that was one of the, I think, epicenters of drum makers um, even prior to the Civil War in the 1820s. You start to see a lot of carriage makers and coach makers. They're making drums as well. Um, there's a family um, in Germantown area that was very well known, Henry Fraley, and then his two son-in-laws, Thomas Bringhurst, and um, uh, I think is William Salter. They were making drums in the early 1820s. Um, another guy in Germantown, William Ent, he had contracts to sell drums to the army during the uh, Mexican War. Hmm. And there's actually it was a receipt sold um, on some, I forget which antique website, but it was a handwritten receipt from um, the government to William Ent about the price of the drums, how many he was going to make them, what they were going to you know, look like, everything. And that was pretty fascinating to have because yeah. that's early. You know, that's 1840s. Yeah, that's so, incredibly early. By the, by the time you get to the Civil War, there's so many records being kept. It's, you know, it's pretty easy to find. Um, the records for the different manufacturers. So I would say, and basically in the Philadelphia region, the big makers of drums, musical instruments, um, mainly are going to be Horsemen. And then you have Conrad and uh, Frederick Soisman. Um, they're supposedly brothers. One was a Cooper, and they come into uh, contract, and they're asked to make 2,000 and 3,000 drums. There's another guy uh, a couple blocks away, Ernest Vaught. He's in Philadelphia making drums. Um, Clemen Brothers, they're also in Philadelphia. And what's real interesting is when you start to take a look at the drums, you can see that a lot of them are probably using the same artist to paint the eagle emblazonments on the front. Yeah. So some people try to identify. There's a lot of different ways to try to identify drums and their manufacturer if there's no label inside. And one of them would be the eagle motif. And you could kind of see uh, some of the tax designs they use and things like that. But it gets very difficult because they were all within a few blocks of each other and were definitely contracting that artwork out to different places. And they, you know, they look the same. You'll say this, you'll see the same eagle motif on multiple maker made drums from different makers. Hmm. So you know that they were using, it's just like today, you know, you get an order from the government and then you turn around and say, okay, I can do this, this, and this, but I can't do these three things. So I'm going to contract it out to these other people to do for me. Yeah, really. And even the same goes for the larger companies. Maybe they got a contract for a thousand drums, but they can't make a thousand because they have to make something else. So they're going to go to another manufacturer and say, hey, I need 2000 or I need a thousand drum shells. Can you send those to me? And mm -hmm. then they'll put them together. Then they pop their label inside. So it's real interesting. You know, it's easy, I think, earlier to tell who the drum maker was because that person really made the drum. As you start to get into the Civil War, it becomes a little bit more difficult because you're wondering, okay, who made the drum or who just put their label in it and sold it? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's similar to, I know with like early, like the, you know, 1920s drums, I was trying to figure out the brand of one that I found at an old antique shop. And Apparently, Leedy was making a ton of them and just sort of uh, or Wahlberg and Auger were, were was like was was being kind of the white label like here, take this and then put your put your information on it kind of thing. Just making shells. So um, that's obviously the the brunt of our of our conversation is, is about the Civil War. But like moving forward here for the sake of time, post 1865, obviously that you said, like we said before, is the heyday of, of, of this type of uh, musician. Where does it go from there? Because it, it, it has to sort of, you know, things get modernized and the form of communication. Yeah, I, th I think what ends up happening is what you start to see is, you know, the fife and drum as a military tool uh, starts to just become obsolete. And you start to see it now turn into ceremonious, um, you know, more ceremonial type of, of activities. You start to see more bands you start to see more public performances. Um, you know the role of fife and drum as it was in the military. Pretty much, 
you know, ceases to exist and the bugle more or less starts to take over because the bugle can be heard very easily over the din of battle. Um, the bugle, I think, really takes over. And then later on, what you start to see after that is these combinations of now fife, drum, and bugle. And the nice thing is, is there's a uh, wax cylinder preservation website that you can check out. And they have recordings from about 1897 to 1903, 1913 of these fife, drum, and bugle corps now playing in parades, and they're on Edison wax cylinders. Hmm. So you can Neat. start to see this progression of where it's going to, which then ultimately leads us to drum corps, DCI, where you have drum and bugle corps, and you start to see even you know Boy Scout groups have fife, drum, bugle corps, and you start to see this, uh, I think, this whole ensemble idea coming together where you're making music for entertainment as opposed to serving a military function, you know, as the as they did it in the Civil War and in previous uh, fife and drum terms in the military. So I think it all goes more towards entertainment. Sure, I would have to say because yeah. really there's no need for it anymore. Once you have two way radios, once you have you know any other sort of communication device, you really are not going to need any musical outlets military wise to wake guys up well you you read my mind would you would you say so it sounds like bugles and radios or whatever form of communication but let's say bugles and radios were the killer of the like you know the drummer for for really practical need in in the uh in, in the military is that right yes yeah, I would think so. But in the U.S., you know, specifically looking at that, once the radio came out, once the I think bugle really caught on, um, both of those kind of just totally put the fife and drum in an obsolete position for the role of of military purposes, hmm. communication wise. Because that's really this the role that fife and drum had in the military was to communicate information in camp life on a daily basis. Yeah. If you have radios, if you have a bugle that's, you know, can sound, then the fife and drum you're really not going to need anymore. Yeah. So you do start to see, you know, Spanish American War and you start to see some other things. The bugle definitely takes precedence. And the fife and drum is, I, there are some, I have some fife and drum manuals from 1918, and but you really, it's not used at all the same way or as widespread as it was. Like I said earlier, the Civil War would be the heyday of the fife and drum in military existence, I would think. Hmm. That's fascinating. I mean, it's 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 sort of sad, but it's also like, it's just the way of the world. Like things happen like that. Technology changes, um, everything changes like that. But I, I want to save some time for you to tell people about how you currently... Um, are playing with this. You're playing with the fife and drum core. And and like maybe there's a young drummer out there who doesn't know anything about this, but they really want to get into it. So so talk a little bit about what's happening modern wise. Um and and I I hope I'm not skipping anything. I imagine in like Vietnam and uh Desert Storm there's not too many like, you know, guys with a snare drum marching along. It's no. more against ceremonial. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, yeah, no, you're, you know, it's interesting today, um, you know, everything is so accessible to us. Um, it's so readily accessible online. And, um, you know, the whole idea of rudimental drumming, you know, traditional rudimental drumming is not as I think wide known, maybe as, as people would even think. I know when I was younger, um, I wanted what I called civil war drum lessons because I didn't even know what the word rudiment was at that time. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Um, so yeah, basically what I started to do is I, you know, found a, a teacher, uh, my parents did actually for me, they found a teacher who taught rudimental drumming and I just started with, okay, what is an open roll sound like? And that's where it started from there, you know, really basic, not even really doing anything with reading music, but being able to hold the sticks correctly and play, you know, this, this long roll as they call it. So there's there's a lot of fife and drum corps up in the New England area. New England is really, really probably, I would say, the epicenter for fife and drum in the United States. 
um, Connecticut, Massachusetts, those places, they have a lot of fife and drum musters as they're called. And, um, they're really interesting to go to I, be, being from Pittsburgh. I would only gone actually to my first fife and drum muster, uh, last summer in deep river. Oh, that's fun. Um, and it was, you know, it's interesting because there's over a hundred fife and drum cores there. There's, you can go online. There's multiple Facebook pages with groups that have fife and drum core, um, you know, information. Um, but the only one that, that was closest to me was the camp chase fifes and drums. And that one was very historically minded. And there's not a lot of, you know, historically minded fife and drum cores around. There's not too many. There's only a few, most of them today, um, are very on the more of the cutting edge of rudiments, more of like the hybrid rudiments and playing things that are, um, written, by people in their group, arrangements in their group. There's very few groups that actually take what is in the fife and drum manual, then present it in a historical perspective to the crowd. Um, and that's what the fife and drum core I do, or that I'm in, actually does. We do a lot of interpretation to explain how it was used. This is what it sounded like. Here's the manuals we got it in. And um, it's very easy to find. We have a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel with some of that information. Um, I just done a presentation on rudiments through, uh, military music ma manuals for the USARD, which is United States Association of Rudimental Drummers. And, uh, that's a, a group that just kind of focuses on rudimental drumming and its history and, and how that all came to be. Hmm. So there's a lot of different, I, I think, outlets, even some museums like Fort McHenry, um, the Fort, uh, Fort McHenry National, uh, Park and Shrine, they have a fife and drum corps that does yearly performances. Um, and they do a lot of very traditional music from the fife and drum manuals from the War of 1812 and even some stuff from the Civil War. Um, they do a nice job there. Uh, I had mentioned my uh, good friend of mine, Pete Emmerich, um, Old Sturbridge Village up in uh, Massachusetts. They do uh, different muster days and um, they perform there, very authentic. Um, but there, there's just not a lot. People aren't, I feel like, as interested in the authenticity side um, because it's not as flashy. It's not as showy. Yeah. But yeah. I think it has its own unique place in everything. Yeah, of um, course. In, in my mind, of course, but I'm biased. <laughs> yeah. Well, would uh, Civil War reenactments and things like that, that would, that would probably be, you know, some form of. I'm sure there's some drummers there, right? There are. I think there's some drummers there. You know, the only the only issue that I ever have with some of the reenactments is a lot of times what you see in the reenactment world because people will ask me that they're like, "Are you you're a Civil War reenactor?" I'm like, "No, not really." Yeah. This the, in the reenactment world, you see a lot of kids who are doing that just until they're old enough to to shoulder a musket. Hmm. And it's not, you know, that's like, oh, I want to come out, which I love the excitement and. I love their, you know, passion for history, but they're basically doing it because they're young and that's what younger kids did. They didn't have guns yet. Hmm. So you're not going to yeah, see okay. a lot of, you know, um, for the most part, you're not going to see a lot of high level fife and drum playing at a, at a reenactment. Um, yeah, I guess but, if you're in a reenactment, you, you know, it's more fun to go charge someone in battle with and... and <laughs> And people, yeah, people yeah. like that, you know, people do that thing. That's, that's their whole deal. You know, yeah. the Fife and Drum Corps I'm in, we, we don't really do reenactments. Okay. Um, we normally go to historical sites and, and we are, you know, there as entertainment, but education. So if we go to the Henry Ford Museum, we're playing, but we're also educating the public on the history of Fife and Drum. Or if we go to Hale Farm and Village um, in Ohio, we do the same type of thing. So what we normally try to do is we try to be entertaining, but also it should be an educational experience. So somebody walks away with, wow, that was a lot louder than I thought. And that was cool. But man, I also learned a little bit. That's, so that's kind of, you know, the whole educational side of it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, on that note, why don't you tell people, you mentioned a YouTube page. Why don't you tell people where they can find you, the groups you're playing with, what you're doing um, and all that good stuff. So if they want to connect with you, they can. Sure. I have a YouTube channel. It's uh, PJ Drums 96. And I just have some videos of Camp Chase uh, playing on there. And then Camp Chase Fifes and Drums also has a, a Facebook page, which is just Camp Chase Fifes and Drums. There's a there's a fan page that's easy to find. And then online, we're org. 
Um, or if you can just type in Camp Chase Fife and Drums, the search engine, it should be able to bring it up. And we have pictures on there. It'll have a link to the um, YouTube channel that I have with all of our different performances. There's also some historical images on there. And then whenever we do have performances, they'll be listed on there as well. And you can come and, and find us. We're usually in the Ohio uh, area, Ohio, Michigan area, kind of the mid, more towards the Midwest region. Um, mm. Gotcha. that way cool i'll have to check you out being in, o- in ohio are you guys more like northern ohio i would imagine you know it depends uh it depends on on basically whoever contacts us okay you know we we're, we don't mind traveling and our group is spread out everywhere so we have guys from chillicothe columbus um pittsburgh pa um we have a couple guys from michigan i know we had a gentleman from indiana so we're all spread out and you know, wherever we, we go, we've done, we've gone down to Cleveland yeah, um, and done some things. They have a Irish festival down there, a Scottish festival. We played at that. So we, that was very cool. interesting there because we were not the norm <laughs> that they're used to seeing. <laughs> yeah. So when we started playing a lot of Scottish and Irish music that was popular during the civil war, they knew all the tunes, but they had never heard it in that arrangement. Oh, that's cool. So we were, we were hit there. That's great. Well, I'm, I'm right in your circle there. So I'd love to see you guys. I'm right on. Uh, so Cincinnati, it's, it's interesting because it borders obviously Northern Kentucky. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I'm, we kinda... played at tall stacks oh, yeah, uh, a cool. couple of times, but they haven't had it in a few years. That was one of our, that was yeah. one of my most memorable gigs that I've ever played at tall stacks. Yeah. It's a, such a neat thing that right, right on the river across from mm-hmm. Newport, Kentucky. Um, so and that's right where the barracks were, um, the Newport barracks for yeah. Field Music School. Man, that's so cool. So, um, well, Patrick, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. And also a big shout out to Mark Robertson again for um, for connecting us. And that's what Absolutely. it's all about is, is people reaching out and saying, hey, you, this guy would be great. And, 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 and he was right. You were a perfect guest on a topic that I uh, was very interested in but didn't know not much about. So I'm, I'm very grateful to have you on the show. Hey, I appreciate the invite. And, you know, Mark Robertson is a great guy. He's a great friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I was real glad that he was able to to make this connection, that we were able to to chat about some things that I'm passionate about and share a little bit of my obsession with everybody else who tunes in. Yeah. And it's been a long time coming. I mean, we've been we've been it's been it's <laughs> been my fault because I, I've been switching the rig up to be at home. But uh, it's been this has been a few months in the making. So I'm glad to have you on here. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks, Patrick. Bye bye. All right. Thanks. Bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.